Welcome again to a study of the Gospel according to Luke. We have uh, come to chapter 2 in this study, and we're titling this chapter, The Nativity of Jesus, because that is the central theme of the text. If you'll read with me, I'm going to read the first seven verses of chapter 2, and then we'll talk about them. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his a spoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Very familiar to all of us. Very familiar really to the world at this, at this time that is called Christmas. But here is a statement about all of God's purposing and how it was fulfilled. The Apostle Paul summarized this when he wrote, In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4. The time was full. It was the right time in history. Everything had been accomplished through four great empires for that moment when the Christ should come. God had ordained history so that all of this could take place. Uh, Caesar Augustus is the one mentioned here. He reigned from 30 B.C. to about A.D. 14. He was absolute monarch. This man had put down all of the civil wars in Rome. His reign provided outwardly a kind of peace and a, an arranged empire. There was more normality in this moment when Jesus came. That will work out well later for the spread of the gospel in a peaceful empire. This statement that Augustus Caesar was absolute monarch is a statement about a prophecy Micah made that troops would come and settle all this in Palestine, Micah 5.1. This taxing was first done here, then there was another one later, according to Acts 5.37. This Quirinius, or Cyrenius, ruled twice, in B.C. and then A.D., 6 through 9. Uh, this Bethlehem Ephratha is the southern city called Bethlehem. There's one in the north in Palestine. And it is mentioned first in the Bible in Genesis 35, 19. Um, notice that he was taxed, Joseph was, with Mary. Uh, she too being subject to this census. She too was of the lineage of David. Uh, according to what we read in history, these taxing census took place every 14 years. But more than all of those details, what I am getting a hold of in this text is the great providence of God. How did all of this work out? How was it that they got to Bethlehem, which Micah said would be the place of his birth, Micah 5, 2? How did that happen? How did God arrange all of history so that this moment could occur? It is marvelous to think about the power that God has just through natural events. No miracle needed, but God could do it by controlling history. Empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and bring all of this together in this marvelous moment when the Christ child is born. Did you notice, dear friend, as we read that, that it was her firstborn son? meaning there were others. Contrary to what is taught in the Roman religion, there were other children. Matthew even makes comment on that, Matthew 1, 25. And this entire passage then 
is about God's providence. Uh, this place where she had the birth take place, according to Justin the Martyr, was a cave. Uh, some have thought it was a stable. Don't know. Um, Constantine the Great had a church built over that cave, uh, that supposed cave, in A.D. 330. I noticed that she wrapped him in what the King James says is swaddling clothes. That's an interesting phrase. It's the only time this is used in the New Testament. It's a medical term. This is a spargama, swathing band. Uh, Hippocrates wrote about this kind of medical band. Uh, it is time then, and the Christ child has been born. Well, this is announced, this birth, to some folks out in a field, shepherds. There is a celebration on December 25th called Christmas. It is assumed by many that that is the actual birth date of the Christ. I want to talk about that a little later when we, when we mention some other things. But we've already noted that Jesus is the cousin of John the Baptizer, and that John the Baptizer was born somewhere around January or February. And Jesus was just six months younger than John, which would put Jesus' birth in either July or August. And so it's the case that December 25th would not be the actual date of this event here when Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem being taxed and Jesus was born. It is the case also that in the next part of this text in Luke 2, from verses 8 through 20, there is a record of some visited by angels. Let's read that. Verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Let me say quite quickly that if they, if they were out in the field, it's not winter. It's not winter. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were extremely or sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Before the wise men ever came, the shepherds were told about the birth of the Christ child. And they are out in a field, indicating a time of year. You will remember from the second chapter of Matthew that the wise men did not visit until Jesus was about two years old. Now I know what your Christmas card said, but they didn't come, and we don't know how many there were. Some have argued for three, of course, because there are three gifts mentioned, but we do really don't know how many there were. Matthew 2, 11. It's interesting also that we're told that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The Book of Mormon has him born in Jerusalem. I think that that book missed it somewhat. And we're, t we're also told here that the shepherds are ordered, don't fear. Don't be afraid of what you're seeing here with all of these angels around, all of this glory. Don't be afraid of that. Because what this indicates is the Messiah is here. What a glorious message. And the only answer to find peace. Don't fear. The Christ child is here. And then the Bible says, And this shall be a sign unto you. You'll find the babe wrapped in that swaddling band, that medical band, lying in a feed box. If you were the second person of the Godhead, how would you decide to come to earth? Would you come out of heaven in a flaming chariot with thousands of angels around you and announce your coming? Lord, who hath believed our report? Isaiah wrote. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before us as a tender plant, a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness that we should desire him. There's nothing special in his appearance. 
And where was he laid? In a feed box. A place where you put feed for animals. This is the second person of the God in a body now. How humbled was he. Paul told us to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be held on to to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. The biggest step any of us will make was to let the mind he had be in us and empty ourselves and serve him. He set the bar really high, did he not? To allow his little body to be laid in a feed box. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. And the American standard has among, good, among men of good will. And that's how you have peace, when you have men of good will. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away, the ancient language in which this was written indicates that they gradually left <coughs> so that the shepherds would know that this was not a hallucination. They had actually seen it happen. Had they suddenly disappeared, perhaps they would have thought, but did we really see that? But they gradually go away and they go back to heaven. The shepherds know exactly now where to go to see this baby. Had they not had that vision, they would not have known where. And so it's interesting that immediately they go where the baby is. Verse 16, they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. They immediately went out and told folks about it. When they had seated, they made known and brought the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all that had heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. If we were to meet Jesus, would we immediately go as Andrew did and tell our brother? Some folks keep it all to themselves, don't they? But these shepherds immediately went out and began to tell others about what they'd seen. The whole Jewish world had expected Messiah. The whole Gentile world had expected Messiah. That's why the wise men came. Here he is, and yet, having expected him for centuries, having wondered about these things for centuries, they're wondering now that they've heard it. They don't immediately accept everything these shepherds tell them. I wonder why people are so slow to accept facts about Jesus, to, re to understand completely what they're being told. Even Mary pondered them. A lesson for us. We, it's all right to ponder about the truth and wonder about it, but the goal is to find it. Buy the truth and sell it not. Let us not be ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Let us find the truth, and He is the truth, and His message is the truth, John 17, 17. The first message, notice it, from heaven to mankind when the Christ came, fear not. This is good news, folks. Fear not. We now read in the text here in chapter 2, in verses 21 through 40, about the circumcision of the Christ child. This was to be done for every male Jew when he was eight days old. We know medically the reason for waiting eight days is that the blood does not coagulate until then, doesn't have the ability to coagulate until the eighth day. That would have had to have been supernaturally told to the original doing circumcision, because, or they would have caused a number of boys to bleed to death before they figured it. And so we know that God told them, you wait eight days. Now here in chapter 2, verse 21, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Savior, Jesus, 
This is very similar to Hosea in the Old Testament, or Joshua, or Yahashua, Savior. Or even the word translated judges is the word Savior. Jesus is raised up because we need someone to save us. And this Jesus is named by heaven. The angel told Joseph to call him that before he was conceived in the womb. His name is already here. Before he came to earth, he was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He preexisted as the second person of the Godhead. Isaiah, in fact, had a vision of this one back in his day, about 740 B.C. He said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Jehovah is the word there. High and lifted up and seated on a throne, and his train filled the whole temple. Isaiah 6 1. We might ask Isaiah, Whom did you see? Because no man has seen the Father at any time. John 1 18. Whom did you see, Isaiah? And Isaiah didn't tell us, but John the Apostle did. John the Apostle talked about the fact that Isaiah saw the second person's glory and spoke of him. This pre existent second person. Has his soul, his spirit, what he is, has entered a human body, prepared for him by the Father, Hebrews chapter 10. And now he is obeying, his parents are actually, obeying the law of Moses about circumcising this boy. <coughs> it's interesting that he obeys the law under which he lives, which is required of all of us. But even in his case, being circumcised didn't take the place of his baptism, which is common to some denominational teaching. Naming the child at circumcision was the way they did it. It's stated here exactly as they did it then. Uh, John the baptizer, Luke 1, 59 through 66, went through the same process. And they were obeying Leviticus 12, 3 and Genesis 17, 19 the laws of circumcision. Then she obeys the law of pur purification, stated in Leviticus 12, 2 through 4. When the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. It's interesting how legalistic the Jews were. According to what I've read about their tradition, they told the woman to wait 41 days just to be safe. Well, the text didn't ask, the God didn't ask them to wait that long, but the Jews did in their legalistic mindset. Now they bring him to Jerusalem, showing he wasn't born there, no matter what that other book says. And according to Exodus 13, 2 and 12, the human son was spared being sacrificed by God's substituting an animal or money or the Levite in the place of the firstborn. The firstborn always belonged to God, but God had made a way of atonement, Exodus 13, 2 and 12. And this presenting of him to the Lord cost Joseph and Mary five shekels. That was the atonement money, because he is, after all, the firstborn. And brothers and sisters and friends, this presenting him to the Lord is an important phrase, because it says, here's the initial picture of Jesus. He's the firstborn. He will be the firstborn in many ways. He will be the firstborn among brethren, to rise from the dead, never to die again. He will be the firstborn in terms of atonement. He's primary. He's preeminent. He is the firstborn. And they did it as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And again, that's a, an allusion to Exodus 13, 2 and 12. The sacrifice for the death penalty imposed on the firstborn what did you say? 
the sacrifice for the death penalty imposed on the firstborn. Jesus is pictured here as to what his mission is. He too will pay a penalty in death. In verses 25 through 28, we are introduced to a man named Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the comfort of Israel, the Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him, him up in his arms and blessed God. There are always a faithful few. We read earlier that many of the Jews wondered, pondered, didn't really accept what the shepherds were telling them. Here's a man who when he sees the Christ child, picks him up in his arms. He's happy. He's seen this one that God had prophesied would come. He's lived long enough to be there, to hold in his arms the Savior of the world. Unlike those others, he knows who this is. He has received revelation to that end. And so he's able to bless and say, read with me, verse 29, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. This text here from 29 to 32 is often called Simeon's hymn of praise. It's as beautiful as any of the Psalms ever thought to be. And Simeon knew by revelation, and he knew as he held that Christ child. He knew as soon as he saw him, he had seen salvation, which God had prepared before the face of all people. Everyone had been told about this coming of the Messiah. The Old Testament prophets constantly pointed to His coming. He'll come, uh, Micah said, in Bethlehem. He'll come, Isaiah said, in Jerusalem as the Savior. He'll come, uh, Daniel said, in the days of the Roman kings. He'll come, Joel said, and the power will come with Him. Over and over again they kept telling the people, He's coming, He's coming, He's coming. Malachi said, He'll come as the S-U-N of righteousness, Matthew, Malachi 4, 2. And when Simeon held him in his arms, he said, This is the light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Here's a Jew who understood that the Messiah wasn't just for the Jews. He was for the world, Jew and Gentile. What a revelation Simeon had and what a privilege to hold that baby in his arms and know I'm looking at the world's salvation in this little child. How happy he was that he lived long enough to see that. And my prayer is that those of you who are listening to this study will live long enough to obey the Christ if you haven't already done it. And I would beg you, if you haven't already done it, to heed the words of Jesus, that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Who can be baptized? Someone who is willing to decide to do what God tells him to do. That's called repentance in Scripture. It precedes baptism. It's necessary requisite to baptism. You must repent. You also must stand before witnesses and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, for with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We have to hear that message, believe it, make a decision to stop sinning, and then we decide at that moment to do whatever God tells us to do. And He says, confess with your mouth, command number one. Command number two, you be immersed in water, and as you come up out of that watery grave, God will take away all your past sins. And my friend, He won't do it before them. That's God's message of salvation, because at that moment, as you come up out of that watery grave of baptism, 
He puts you into salvation. He puts you into the Christ. He puts you into the church. He, he covers you with the blood of His Son. And as Simeon held that baby that day, he knew he was looking at the salvation of the world. It's sad to me to hear a man get on television, radio, write things, publish books saying, all you need to do to be saved is say the sinner's prayer. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and you'll be saved. Nothing like that is taught anywhere in Scripture. In fact, to ask Jesus to come into my heart would be backwards. I have to get into Christ where the gospel is, where all the children of God by faith, where is it located, Paul? In Christ Jesus. Well, how do I get there? Do you not know that so many of us as we're baptized into Christ have put on Christ? Galatians 3, 26 and 27. It's one thing to study the Bible, friend. It's another to obey it. It's another to see what it says and go ahead and do it. Why don't we all be like Simeon was? Let's take the evidence right before our eyes and glorify God and be thankful that we have seen the Lord's salvation, that we know who the Christ is. We know what He said. We know what He told us to do to be saved. Isn't it amazing? that Christ came here and still men are confused in faith and in religion. How is that possible? Did He cause all this confusion by teaching this to one man and the, another thing to another person? How did it happen that we have all this confusion in salvation? What caused that? It wasn't Jesus. It was men. The Apostle Paul warned the elders of his day that of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Sadly, these departures from the truth of the New Testament started in the leadership of the early church. They have continued for 2,000 years. And as I speak to you on this DVD, as we talk about these statements from Holy Writ, I'm reminded over and over again how far away men and women and boys and girls have gotten from this book and from what it actually says. And they are paying attention to what preachers say. They're paying attention to what some creed says. But like Simeon, they should be looking at the Christ. He is the salvation of the world. And they should be asking themselves, what did He tell us to do? He said, He that believes, and coordinating conjunction, is baptized, immersed, shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. The things that Simeon said even stunned Joseph and Mary. Look at verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Simeon had spoken by inspiration. He had received revelation from God Himself. This is the Christ child. And here are Joseph and Mary said to have marveled, wondered, were astonished at what Simeon said. Uh, it's hard to put all of that together because we know Mary had been told that that which was conceived in her was of the Holy Spirit. We know that Joseph was told the same thing. They both knew the origin of this child's birth. And yet, they were marveling at what's said here by an inspired priest named Simeon. It's really interesting how long it takes people to realize this is the Christ child, this is the Messiah, this is salvation. I suppose that all parents marvel at the first thing said about their children. Simeon's prophecy, however, goes beyond the angels knowing of the child's destiny. It goes beyond what we know because we've read the end. We know what happens to Christ. It goes beyond 
even what Simeon said, because what we have here is the fact that we are going to be thrilled and his parents are still wondering about this expectation of this little baby boy. I think I can understand that. But it's interesting. They have information, but they're still marveling at what Simeon says. Holding that baby, this is the salvation of the world. Zechariah said on one occasion, wrote on one occasion, don't despise the day of small beginnings. You saw that baby, would you think, there's the salvation of the world. Uh, where are you laying him? In a feed box. Isn't it amazing how preachers today hold these stadium-filled revivals and they bring in football players and Miss America and I wonder how the Lord would do all of that. I remember how Paul did it. When he went into the city of Corinth, he said, I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm not going to have a show here. I'm going to come in the simplicity of God. God came to us in a little baby. And except we become like little children, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 18, 3. In verse 34, we have a number of Old Testament passages fulfilled, especially from Isaiah and Hosea. Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary's mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Isaiah 8:14. Hosea 14, 9, mentioned again by Peter, Acts 3, 14 and 15, and 1 Peter 2, 6 and 7. What, is, what we're told is that the prophet said that when he comes, Israel will speak against him. John wrote, the apostle John, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1, 11 and 12. It must have been, I don't know if I can use the word disappointing with Jesus, but something must have been felt there in His human form. When He came to save His own people, his, the Jewish people, and they rejected Him, I do remember that He said to those in His hometown of Nazareth, after he had read from Isaiah 61 1 in the synagogue one day about the fact that those verses spoke about him, he said, Did you know that a prophet's not without honor, save in his own country? And you remember that they drove him out of Nazareth. His own people rejected him. What a terrible feeling that has to be. But it also the case. There could be a fall and rising again. It is the case that some of those Jews that rejected Him while He was here had an opportunity when the church started to obey Him again. Perhaps that's what's meant here. I do know He's quoting from the prophets, Luke is, and I do know that the Jews did reject Him. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote a great deal about this Jewish attitude toward the Christ. Romans 9, 10, and 11, all three chapters, are dealing with a problem that the Jews had. They seemed to be making the argument that since God had used them to bring the Messiah, and that was the case that He did, that God had to save them. And they couldn't understand how God could bring the Gentile in and reject them, when in fact the opposite occurred. They rejected the Christ, and they, the message then went out to the Gentiles, Acts 13, 46. But this rising and again, there seems to have been a case here where there could be a second chance for some of these Jews who rejected Him while He was on earth. But the prophets already knew He'll be rejected by His own people. 
and their argument, it doesn't make sense. Just because God uses someone doesn't say that that person is going to be saved. There's no indication there of that. God used Pharaoh. Pharaoh wasn't saved, uh, according to Romans chapter 11. You have here a, an interesting dilemma. Uh, years ago, I met a lady who is a Catholic nun, and her whole life had been a life of service, sacrifice. Never married, never had children. She taught in one of their schools for over 40 years. She was pure in her lifestyle, a very intelligent woman. She had come to Memphis to visit. She actually made her home in New York, but she was visiting some friends who were members of the church. And we got to talking, and I was trying to indicate to her what the plan of salvation is from the Bible, that men must repent, confess, and be baptized. And as we talked, she said something very interesting, very heart-rending, quite sad. She said to me, you mean to tell me that this entire life of service doesn't mean anything? The Jews were saying to Paul, you mean to tell me that all these years that God used us, worked through us to bring the Messiah, doesn't count for anything? The answer to that is, no, it doesn't. But the obedience to God does. Saul was told quite explicitly to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel 15, 22. My friend, it's not what I do. It's not the sacrifice I make. It's God who saves me. And He saves me based on conditions, and only on those conditions. Hard for the Jews to accept that. And the prophets were told by God, you tell them that when He comes, He'll be spoken against. Even one of Jesus' friends lifted up his heel against him, Judas. And it's quoted about Ahithophel who did the same thing to David, that mine own familiar friend hath lifted up his heel against me. We then read, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary, Simeon says, something's going to happen that will pierce your heart. In Latin, Mary is referred to often as Mater Dolorosa, Mother of Sorrows. What a, a thing to remember. This boy grew up in her house. They probably had lots of hugs and fun times and good times and laughter. But did she keep that thought in her mind all those years? One of these days, your heart will be pierced. In fact, your own soul will be. There's a, a tragedy coming, Mary. You need to get ready. that the thoughts of many hearts shall be revealed. Pay attention to that, my friend. God already knows the inclination of the hearts of men. And this coming of the Christ is of such an import that there a clear division takes place when He appears in His teaching to men. There is a division that takes place between, between those who will really serve Him and those who are hostile to Him. There are no in-betweens here. 
You're either for Him or against Him. And so the thoughts of my heart is, are, are revealed when I meet the teaching of the Christ. Will I obey it or will I reject it? And that's how that message is designed. It's a sword. It can cut to the very center of my soul. And so that message through the Christ will either do what it did to Simeon and he'll be happy that he saw the Lord's salvation or he will be rejected. We're next introduced to a woman named Anna. There was one Anna, a prophetess of the daughter of Pharaoh, Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, Aser in the King James. Let's stop there for a moment. There is a doctrine taught by a multitude of denominational teachers and preachers that the kingdom of God is not here yet. That the Christ, when He comes back, will set it on earth. And He will sit on a throne, literally sit there, in Jerusalem and rule the world for 1,000 years. We are familiar with the fact that this doctrine is called pre-millennialism. Pre meaning before, millennial meaning a thousand. And I always add, ism means it ain't so. The kingdom of God is already here. Paul had been translated into it, Colossians 1.13. People were added to it on the day of Pentecost. The apostles were given the keys to it, and they used those keys to open the church. The kingdom of God on earth is the church of Christ. But the argument is made by many that when the Christ came and the Jews rejected Him, as was prophesied, that He set the kingdom aside and put the church in its place. But when He comes back, He'll set up the kingdom. Imagine a doctrine that says that Jesus failed in His mission. He came to set up the kingdom, but He couldn't do it because the people rejected Him. The question comes to my mind as to what would keep us from rejecting Him the second time and making Him go back and come back later and set up the kingdom. What man does does not control what God does. He did set up the kingdom. He did start the Church of Christ. But in this doctrine of premillennialism, we're told that the ten northern tribes who split off under Jeroboam from Rehoboam's two southern tribes when the split took place in the United Kingdom of Israel, that those ten tribes went into captivity and have been forever lost. In fact, I've heard premillennial preachers say that they will be reoccurring in England and the United States one day when Jesus comes back. Well, they have a serious problem here with Anna because she's of the tribe of Asher, supposedly one of the ten lost tribes. Well, Anna didn't know it. Her parents didn't know it. Her children didn't know it, if she had any. But Phanuel would have known he was of the tribe of Asher. Not a lost tribe at all. And this one verse forever crushes for me this false doctrine of premillennialism. Here is a woman of the tribe of Asher. She is 84 years of age. And the Bible says she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. It's amazing to me that she was only married for seven years and had been a widow such a long, long time. It's also the case that she's a prophetess. You remember that Deborah, was a prophetess in Israel, Judges 4.4. 4. You remember the prophetess Huldah, 2 Kings 22.14. So it is not unusual to have a female prophetess in the Jewish system. She's of the tribe of Asher. 
It's possible, according to what we know from the way the temple was built, that Anna lived in one of the rooms in the temple. That was always done for these ladies. Uh, verse 40 here, we're told that Jesus is 12 then, but here we're not told exactly how old he was. And we're told when we get there that he will be subject to the ordinary laws of nature. But Anna has met the inescapable one. And she coming in that instant when, he, when she saw him, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. This inspired prophetess has taken a position regarding the Christ. This is Messiah. He's here. So you have now Luke giving you two witnesses, Simeon and Anna. You have the witnesses of the shepherds. This is the Christ child. You have the witness of Joseph and Mary. This is the Christ child. The fact that he was born and laid in that crib, that uh, feed box, that manger, was not without witnesses. These are actual living people who saw him. And Luke overwhelms us with all of these evidences of who he is. I want to suggest from studying about the shepherds and Simeon and Anna that my attitude is shaped in my character when I look at the Christ. What I think about Him reveals what I am, not so much what He is. I know what He is. He's the Messiah. But when I take an attitude toward Him, um, I understand He's looking at my heart. He's trying to get me to change inwardly. He's working on my character. He's not interested in my fleshly appearance. He's not interested in my position in life. He's looking at my inward soul. And my attitude reveals my core character. What's my soul like? A relative of mine was a reprobate, alcoholic, abusive to his wife and children, unfaithful to his wife had been in prison on several occasions for activities that are illegal. Yet when he died, some around him said, well, he's in heaven. Because he always said, Jesus is with me. Disappointingly, in his case, Jesus wasn't with him. His character would not allow the Christ in his life. His character is revealed by his activities. Jesus is not looking at something I said. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at my soul. He's looking at my character. And I, when I look at Him, I have to admit I need to obey Him. Interestingly, as Luke talks about his being a baby, he jumps ahead a few years for us, and we meet the Christ again here at the age of 12. Let's read it. Verse 40, Luke 2. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Apostolic preaching will deal mostly with his ministry. Luke deals with his childhood here. We don't know a lot about his first 30 years. They're not recorded. We're grateful Luke puts this here for us. Because we don't know a lot about his early years, there were men who took upon themselves to write amazing stories about him. These so-called gospel accounts are known as apocryphal books. Little a apocryphal, meaning they were written after the time of Christ. If you see a capital A on the word Apocrypha, those are books written between the Testaments during the intertestament period. 
that have to do with Jewish apocalyptic literature. But after the Christ came and went back to heaven, these books were written, some of them just plain false writings. In fact, in one book called the Evangelion, <laughs> Jesus is said as a little baby to heal his friends and heal their toys and all that kind of thing. And all of that came out of the fact that we're not told a lot about him during those first 30 years of his life. Well, that would tell me we didn't need to know it. Because what we're told here in the Bible is about our salvation and what that takes. But here we do meet him when he is 12 years old. So Luke can indicate to us, look, I just showed you that the shepherds thought he was the Christ. I just showed you that Simeon did. I just showed you that Anna did. But I want you to see now that even the priests of the day saw something marvelous and wonderful and extraordinary in this 12-year-old boy because he could sit in the temple and argue theology with these priests. And so he's 12 years old, and his parents who went to the Passover every year, the way the Jews must do it, are there. And he, they go to after the custom of the Passover feast. I noticed that Jesus never asked them, do I have to go? <laughs> Our children never asked us, do we have to go Sunday? Do we have to go Sunday night? Do we have to go Wednesday night? That question was never asked because it was just a case that we went. That's what we did. And I think that's what Mary and Joseph are like. They just went and the son went with them. It was their custom, their habit, and that's what they did. They weren't legally required to go, especially Mary. Joseph was required to go three times a year, but not Mary, and certainly not this boy. But they go with Joseph. It's interesting that they were in a position, living in Nazareth, to be able to get there. A lot of Jews at this time had been dispersed in so many places, it was impossible to get to Jerusalem three times a year. But the, the feast is over, seven days. They fulfill the days and they're returning to Nazareth. And Jesus cherries behind. I don't read into that that he disobeyed his parents. I read into that that something happened that shows us this is the Christ. This is an important event here. But his mother and Joseph don't know that he's in the temple. And they go on. They supposed he was in the company. I've read some commentaries that ind indicate and hint that in those days the boys would like to walk behind the procession somewhere. Maybe so. And so when they can't find him, they look among all their relatives and people they know. But when they found him not, one night as we were coming home from evening services, I had my oldest son and my daughter, but I turned around to look for a moment and I said, where's Mark, <laughs> our youngest son? Wow, we turned right around and went back to the church building. And here he was sleeping on the pew. We were frightened at first, but there he was. And I wondered if Mary and Joseph were frightened at first because they are looking for him. But they, it took them three days to find this boy. And he's sitting in the midst of the doctors of the law, listening and asking them questions. Twelve-year-old Jewish boy. I don't know if he had been bar mitzvahed yet. I don't know that. Had he been made a son of the law? That's what happened at 12. But the, or Actually at 13. But he knows enough here to discuss theology with these doctors of the law. And he knows enough to astonish them with his understanding and his answers, his defenses of what he's saying. What are we told? He knows who He is. I believe He knows who He is. And I believe that for another reason. I believe that because of what He told His mother. It took them longer to find Him than to lose Him. Keep that in mind, preachers. It took His parents longer to find Him 
than it did to lose him. That could be true of a lot of my brothers and sisters who leave the church. It may take you longer to find him than it did to lose him. But he's sitting there discussing theology with these folks. And his parents finally see him, and they're amazed at what he's doing. I'm grateful they found him in the temple. Young people, if you're listening to this ever, they didn't find him in a dance hall or a bar. They found him in a temple. I hope your parents will always find you there in a temple. But this text is about his being the Christ, the second person of the Godhead, deity in the flesh. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He knows who he is. He knows who his father is, in this instance referring to God. He knows what his mission is. He will always know that. Some of his apostles later on will try to, try to dissuade him from his mission. He will stop them and tell them to get behind him. But here, an interesting statement made about Joseph and Mary. It says they didn't understand what he just said to them. His father's business? Again, it's amazing that with all the information they had about his birth, it was still puzzling to them about his goal and his mission. And then we're told that in a natural way, Jesus grew just like everyone else does in wisdom, what he knew, his height, stature, and in his social abilities, favor with God and man. I'm happy to report to you that eventually Mary will know him as Lord. But what we have here in the second chapter and so far in the text, Luke has pictured Jesus for us as a perfect physical specimen, morally strong, intellectually superior, spiritually intact. Jesus can save us and make us morally, intellectually, and spiritually intact. We too can become a whole man under His teaching. And really that's our goal anyway. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole of man. I thank you again for your interest in studying Luke. In our next se session, we'll take a look at Luke chapter 3. Thank you for being with us. Roll.